some of that up. Good afternoon. Whoa. He has to set that on one for me. Those of you who know me, don't want that too high. Thank you for coming uh, this afternoon. Uh, what a great conference. Don't you think? I've been coming here for about 20 years yeah. and it's just amazing the energy and the fellowship and the networking and uh, the quality of presentations, at least the ones that I went to, have been uh, wonderful. Uh, so I thank you for joining me for this. Uh, my name is Patrick Tompkins, and I serve as Dean of Communications, Humanities, and Social Sciences at Thomas Nelson Community College. And what I'm going to share with you today are the results of my uh, dissertation research on late registration and student success in on-campus and online classes. And so the goals for this session will be for you to actually share your thoughts and beliefs, your knowledge about late registration, for us together to review some of the literature and to uh, review the study that I conducted, share that with you. Uh, and then I think these next two are especially important, evaluate the evidence regarding late registration and student success, and then discuss the implications for policy and research. So to begin, I'd like to invite you, and there are microphones around the, the room, you can grab one of those, I can repeat what you say. I'd like to invite you to, um, well, why do we have late registration? What is the purpose of it? Boost enrollment. Money, yeah. Money, revenue. Access. Increase educational opportunities. Because it's uh, the students keep begging for it because we're responding to uh, customer, if you'll forgive that term, demand. Being responsive to our audience. Anything else? Serving student needs, meeting student needs. So the research is showing access. We've talked about that. Customer service innovation. Jamie uh, mentioned that one. It provides choice, flexibility, and its responsiveness. Jaressa talked about responding to student need. And of course, enrollment, which relates to revenue. So take a look at this quote from Terry O'Banion and see, does this ring true for you? And I, and I invite some commentary on this. Late registration wreaks havoc on the ability of colleges to achieve the goals of the emerging completion agenda. And so the, the completion agenda is something that is in the uh, air and in the water in higher education, particularly in community colleges, to get students over the finish line. And uh, Terry O'Banion, former president of the League for Innovation, uh, says that late registration wreaks havoc with our attempt to achieve this. What do you think? Does that ring true for you? Yes. Getting, getting lots of yeses and uh, head shakes and a no, which is helpful. Go ahead. Not necessarily, Jaras, did you? You said no? Okay. Can you expand on that a little? Well, 
I mean, I think we can abuse the late registration and extend the deadlines too far, but I think if we give the first group of classes close it off with a chance to make up their mind and choose the right step, I think we do more good than we do harm. I think we also have to address their policy. Sorry, I got one right here. Okay. Testing. Um, having a week as an, an opportunity for them to come in is, I think, is an advantage. It allows students sometimes to find the best fit. They get in with an instructor and realize that's not what they wanted, or they're a first-time student, and it occurs to them, oh, missed a deadline. Can I get in? Um, the amount of late registration we have, if you look at it percentage-wise, per class isn't that much. I mean, I don't have that many students coming in late, to be honest. One percent, maybe. I think the bigger effect on completion is if we punish them for being a late registered student and we hold that against them. I think the way we set up our course leads to their success and I think future success depends on how we treat them if they are late. If we, if we teach them a lesson and say, you know, remind them, be on time, be on time, I think we can have good come out of it. Uh, I appreciate those comments and Laura, you wanted to add. I'll just uh, you, need, you need it because we're oh. broadcasting this. Okay. My question would be, how are you defining late registration? We'll get to that. Because that can play a big role on even the discussion that's coming. Very good point, the way we define it. And Terry O'Banion says that the evidence against late registration, that late registration is inimical to student success, is overwhelming. And that's been repeated by other folks. Uh, Sandy Shugart from Valencia Community College visited with the Reengineering Task Force, Ty will remember, uh, and told us the same thing, that, hey, this case is closed. Uh, and so we're not serving students well. What are the disadvantages of late registration? Students who enroll in the class on time don't buy books. They don't attend class during the first week because they decide ahead of time there's nothing going to be covered that's important. Um, many of the students use that as sort of an extra vacation week and show up as a, I guess, a gift to the instructor on the beginning of the next week. Um, and I find a lot of problems with students getting so far behind even from week one. I teach developmental psychology. We have a 20 chapter textbook that has to be covered in one semester. If I don't start to the second week, then we're already four, four chapters behind. Uh, John and Sue Ann Roosh, two uh, uh, vocal critics of late registration, say the first minutes of the first class of the uh, first week are the most critical, and that's what you're talking about. Other uh, disadvantages? I would just agree with that from a developmental math point of view. You miss one week of classes, you've missed a quarter of your class. In that four-week session class. And they are already developmental students. Coming back from that is virtually impossible. Great. Other disadvantages? Please. In the first class, I explained the roadmap for the entire course. Um, I use an online homework system. I explain daily quizzes. I explain the criteria for getting your lowest test grade replaced with the final exam grade. Now, all of that is in the syllabus. So, if your late start student reads the syllabus carefully and tries to internalize all of it, they haven't missed everything. But my experience is those who start late are continually surprised at how the course is being run and most often don't finish the course with me. So uh, they, they're not getting that first day experience. Right. If they were to follow up on their own, maybe that would uh, mitigate some of those concerns. Joanne? Um, I think it also creates a big administrative burden because uh, a lot of students are running around to different offices trying to get permission. Um, you know, we have a, a week where it's open, you know, they can still get in after it started, but then what I find in, uh, as a dean that students are coming in the second and the third, like it kind of opens up that opportunity where people think they can still get in way, way, way into the semester. Uh, that, that dean perspective is, is very welcome because of that administrative uh, piece and I'm sure if staff members if they're in the audience would talk about that as well. Anything else you want to note on the disadvantages? And so this is what the research is showing, okay? You're going to be shocked. It costs money to register students late because if that staff member is registering a student late, that staff member is not providing counseling or they're not uh, working on something else. The lost first day of class we've talked about, uh, student success in terms of grades, retention, transfer awards, and then is it ethical 
That's a disadvantage. Is it ethical to put somebody into a class uh, where you know that their likelihood of success is diminished because of an, a policy that you as an institution implemented? Why do students register late? The student has lost his or her financial aid because of the The student has lost his or her financial aid and must appeal for reinstatement of that aid. Financial aid. What else? Uh, Lack of knowledge about how to do college, uh, particularly for first gen students. What else? Go ahead, Joanna. What I find sometimes is that students are on vacation. You know, in the summertime, they don't realize that classes start, or in the wintertime, they're still off and about. Um, so I get a lot of students coming back saying that, you know, I missed the first week for, for that reason. Particularly here in Virginia, where there is a, by statute, public high schools open after Labor Day, but we start before Labor Day, and you were mentioning, Bob, about the high school uh, experience. And so that student doesn't realize that we've already begun classes because in their entire academic career, class has never started when we have. Other reasons that they register late. OK. Most of them realize school has started. Well, yep. OK, Sharon. Changing their scheduling in their life outside. Uh, change in their scheduling in their life outside of the college classroom. It's a time of, I've, uh, a lot of students have told me it's a time of transition. They're starting a new job. They're, if they're non-traditional students, something has changed with their child care, stuff like that. So there's just a, a lot of reasons they can't get into the college schedule as smoothly as they want to. That word transition I thought was really important. Uh, perhaps oversimplifying, but we allow them to. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the brevity of that answer. I think that's what um, one thing I will say, I think our students in general can be very deadline driven. Um, you know, I, I can be the same way. My taxes are due on a particular day. I'm going to do it a couple of days before my taxes are due. <laughs> um, I think students a lot of times, the deadline prompts the action, even though, of course, we would love for them to be to do things well in advance of that. Sometimes it's that deadline that prompts them to engage in whatever process we need them to. Really good point. I've... Sometimes I'll have students coming in late simply because the class was filled and they couldn't get in. And then it's not till I have a couple students actually dropping that first day when we actually tell them what we're doing in class that a seat opens up. And then they jump in on that seat as soon as possible. And it goes back to what Chris was saying about we allow them to. Not only do we allow them, we encourage them, right? Because they come to the office, Joanna, and we say there's no seat in there, but keep checking. Something might open up this week. So we encourage them, hey, get into that class late. You might be able to in a couple of days. Sometimes students are shopping. That's good. They're shopping. Uh, so the research shows 46% uh, it's uh, schedule conflicts. And this is based on several uh, dissertations. The earliest one is uh, Chilton 1964, first, dis first uh, publicly available study on late registration. And then a particularly good one was uh, Keck in 2007 and her interviews with students. Uh, here are other ones that I don't think will be unfamiliar to you. Since we're streaming, I, I will read these out loud. Paperwork, medical, finances, employment, Transportation, life, raise your hand if any of those sound unfamiliar to you. Other reasons, advising problems, they were advised into the wrong class. Instructor problems, uh, Laura mentioned shopping, sometimes the instructor shop. The class is too hard, procrastination we mentioned. Late decision to go to college, you know, they, they decide at the last minute. Job relocation and uh, class cancellation. So they were registered, they had a great schedule and they go to the class and it's not there and now they need biology so that they can stay full time and can graduate on time. And then uh, personal convenience, the research by Keck shows that personal convenience was uh, a, a very small 4%. Now this is self-report, so uh, it's just important to note that. Students, Keck in her interviews uh, concludes that students make informed choices because they said that the reason they registered late is their family said, hey, you should go back to school. Why don't you register? Because they talked to faculty and advisors who said, oh, no, you can get in that class. Get, come here now. Don't miss a semester. I know you're a little late, but we'd rather have you here uh, now. Uh, or they have a connection with an advisor. 
they say that they take into account their individual background and their determination to complete. And you're going to see this pop up uh, here. They avoid online and hard courses. So they told CAC, they said, oh, I wouldn't register late for every course. I would never register late for an online course. And students said that they avoided uh, registering late for online. Uh, and they said, I registered late for that course because I'm good in history. Or, no, I'm not registering late for history because that's a course I don't do well in. I want to be there from the first day. I think it's interesting. They said, students said that if they could, they would avoid late registration. So it's not, some, it's not their first choice, according to their self-report. But they s emphasized that it's a viable and a critical option for them. They said it was an essential option that they needed. And they were satisfied with their decisions, even when they did not succeed in the late registration class. Kex asked them, well, do you regret it? And they said, nope, I'd make the same decision again. I think it's interesting. I think it's important for us to ask students about their experience so that we can better understand how institutional policies and practices are affecting that outcome. Uh, I, I refer to data as dumb data. It doesn't tell you anything. You know, it just gives you these numbers, and then you've got to figure out what does that mean. And I think one way in, not the only, one way in is by uh, getting the student story. If we look at the literature on late registration, there have been, and I did a presentation on this last uh, New Horizons, there have been about 30 publicly available studies, and they focus on, on all kinds of different things, and they are of varying quality. These that I'm going to go over here are most directly pertinent to the study I conducted, but they're actually very illustrative of the type of research that you're going to see out there. So these studies focus on uh, student success defined as completing the course. You see these early studies, they just look at headline numbers. What was the percentage of late registrants that completed? What's the percentage of uh, on time? And SOVA finds a negative effect in 1986, studying college level English classes and developmental English classes. Angelo, who claims to have pro, uh, published the first study of late registration in a journal, inconveniently finds that students who registered late for a course were more likely to succeed in that class. Oops. More recently, we see more sophisticated statistical modeling. And Hale and Keck, they find mixed effects. Uh, Keck, for example, finds that students who register late for four or five classes were more likely to complete than students who registered on time. And those who registered late for one or two classes were less likely to complete. So it's not a uniform phenomenon. There is, seems to be some variability. Zotos finds no significant effect. And his, uh, the, his is really, really representative of most of the research on late registration. And worth noting, Zotos is uh, finding there because he says, okay, I've done the study, no significant effect, and so we shouldn't worry about late registration anymore. And that's interesting because Terry O'Banion in his two Jeremiah ads against late registration, one of them, he cites this Zoto study as evidence for why late registration should be stopped. Uh, I'll go back, and I'm treating O'Banion a little unfairly now. I'll tell you specifically what he's citing from that Zoto study in a little bit. When we look at the student success context, what we're talking about is that current context of assessment culture and of accountability, data-driven decision-making, not making policies based on anecdote or inclination, but saying, are we serving students well? How do we know? What can we do to serve them better? Student success theory going back decades, I think uh, folks like uh, Tinto and Aston and Bean and Metzger and uh, Terrazzini and Pascarella, you're talking about student engagement theory, student involvement theory. Basically, this is the, the thing, and this was the hypothesis in my study, that a student who is engaged is more likely to succeed. And, I, and there's a lot of data on that, a lot of research that shows that. And I hypothesized that being there on the first day of the class is to be more engaged, that that student is going to be more engaged with the class, the faculty member, and their peers, and they will be more likely to succeed. My study also, as you saw on the title slide, brings in online classes, and we know that there are differential success effects in online and on campus. So uh, when we look at late registration, I wondered if students who registered late into online classes would be at an even greater disadvantage than those registering late into an on-campus class. And then there has been, uh, for example, in the BCCS, a big push on uh, SDV 100 classes and requiring those. And Northern, which is uh, trying to eliminate late registration, is also requiring that those students complete that SDV 100 class in that first semester. Uh, the research on it is pretty mixed. First off, there's not a lot of quality research on it. Uh, this one, 
uh, from Zeinberg, Jenkins, and Calgano is uh, very, very well done. Uh, it seems to conclude that those courses are success are effective. You have to look at that research and see if you if you think that uh, their methodology bears that out. There's some research that shows that uh, academic skills and intervention courses particularly are helpful, as opposed to first year experience courses. So that uh, giving the students the academic uh, tools that they need. The type of student, for example, was he weak in his other classes and he registered later? Is this just looking at them generically? There have been ones that looked at, uh, for example, GPA as a proxy. Did it make any difference? Well, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> so the purpose of this study was to advance our understanding of late registration, how it affects uh, student success, uh, particularly in the BCCS, as this is a hot topic, and uh, I think uh, it's worth finding out, particularly in our context, is this important for us to look at. You asked about the definition of late registration. For this study, it was defined as enrollment into a course on or after the first day of the semester. This is the most common definition of late registration in the research. Probably not the best one. Here are the, I, there were three research questions. The first one, what effect does time of registration on time or late? and course delivery mode on campus or online have on student success in that class. And the other research questions just build off of this. The second one, time of registration, course delivery mode, student success, but what happens when we control for a student who has successfully completed a college success skills course? And then the third one is going to continue those same independent and dependent variables and then add in demographics. And um, that was alluded to earlier. So I was blessed that the Virginia Community College system uh, provided me with data, and I think maybe they had an interest in this study as well. I, you know, just talking with them, they, they, they thought it was worthwhile. Uh, and that, that was really good because it provided a large, ho relatively homogeneous data set. And what I mean by that is we have one course description for SDV 100, although it's implemented in different ways. Uh, we define online the same way across the VCCS. The data points are common. And so uh, it, gives you a, uh, it gives you a less dirty data set. I looked at three spring semesters, 11, 12, and 13. First time in college students in their second semester, and I want to just briefly mention why I, I chose that. So there is some research that shows that it depends on where the student is in their academic career, whether it affects them. So we would expect that late registration would affect the new student or the returning student more, which Right, the research shows it affects the returning student more. And one of the folks who did that study hypothesized that that is a repeat offender. So in your first semester, you get these accidental regist late registrants, these folks whose financial aid got held up, or who made a late decision, or they relocated uh, to the area, uh, or they were in the wrong class, or they didn't know how to do college. And uh, I hypothesized that some of those would go away by the second semester. And that your second semester, you may be seeing less of the accidental late registrant and maybe more of a true late registrant. The other reason the second semester is because I wanted first time in college because I'm trying to uh, bracket off any previous college experience, but I needed uh, students to have an opportunity to complete SDV 100 because that was part of the study. So these would have been students who in their first semester, which is where we want them to do it, their first semester complete SDV 100, what happens to those uh, students? It was a census population, so the random sampling was not uh, involved here. I was able to include all of the cases that met the criteria within that time period. Just for 95, excuse me, 95,458 cases. Just for clarification, because I can't remember, SDV 100 was like a 16-week class, an 8-week class. Did it run at a normal at a normal 16-week pace, in other words, versus an 8-week pace or a 5-week pace? Great question. I didn't control for that duress, and so that would be a weakness in this study. I used a binary logistic regression method. You don't have to know much about that except to know that it's uh, only one other study used this method and the methods that have been used in other studies, particularly ones which found a negative uh, relationship, those statistical methods really aren't defensible. They're, using, they're looking at the wrong data point or they're using a statistical method, particularly the ANOVA. 
They're using an ANOVA analysis for uh, grades, and that's really probably not the most appropriate. We can talk afterwards if you want more uh, on that. But um, one of the researchers, Hiller, 2006, specifically makes this point. He says that uh, the ANOVA is untenable as a statistical methodology for this type of study. Uh, there are seven independent variables and one outcome variable, and here are the independent variables. You have registration timing, on time or late. Uh, all of them are dichotomous, either or. Class delivery mode, on campus or online. Student success skills, and I define this as a student who successfully completed the course or did not take it. I excluded students who took the course but didn't pass it because I didn't want that as a confounding variable. Gender, female and male. Race I broke down dichotomously for a couple of reasons. So white, Asian, and unknown is in one category, and non-Asian minority is in another category. Because if I had looked at uh, all, I think there were eight categories, uh, some of the cells would have been so small that the statistical analysis would not have been uh, tenable. That is, uh, if you looked at the uh, late registrant in an online class who completed the success skills course was male and was um, 22 years of old, age of older, and a full-time student and was a Hawaiian Pacific Islander, well, there were zero of those students in the study. So I had to combine them. The other reason is because the research shows that the, that first grouping, the white, Asian, unknown, that their student success in general is different than that other grouping. Age broken dichotomously, 18 and 21-year-olds in one group, greater than 22 in another, and then full-time and part-time enrollment defined by uh, 12, 12 or more credits, which is the definition we're using in the BCCS. The dependent variable was successful completion of the course, and that was dichotomous. You did or you didn't, and it was defined as a grade of C or higher. That was chosen because that's our definition in the BCCS of success. That's the grade that will transfer. Some of the studies I look at define it as a D, for example. So what were the findings? The first one is about student success in terms of late registration and course delivery mode. And this is important. So there's a statistically significant difference between the on-time and late registrants. The late registrants don't perform as well. However, most studies don't do that third bullet there, which is to look at the effect size. And when you look at the effect size, it's a very weak effect. You don't have to know Nagel Kirk's R. Uh, I'll I will visually demonstrate to you uh, how small that effect is. Uh, a, logistic, a logistic regression model is going to uh, try to predict success and non-success, and it will assess its own ability to do that. And so without taking anything into account, just kind of blindly predicting who's going to succeed and who's not going to succeed, the model is able to predict that 68.5% of the time. When you add in late registration and course delivery mode, you only get a 0.2% increase in the predictive accuracy of the model. It's minuscule. When we add in the uh, college success skills course, statistically significant, again, a very small effect size, no improvement over the previous model, and very slight improvement over the constant only model. And then in the third research question where we add in demographics, statistically significant, again, a very small effect size, and again, minimal improvement. This model now uh, accounts for 69% of the variation, or predictive accuracy is 69%. It's 0.5 percentage points above the constant only model. It's 0.3 percentage points above the other models. Here's the visual that I was talking about. So we uh, graph uh, explained and unexplained variation. And so zero would be that the model did not explain any variation in student success. And one would be that it perfectly explained it. And so if late registration, demographics, uh, the college success skill course, the course delivery mode was a, a good predictor, then we would see a lot of explained variation. And you in the back can't even see the unexplained variation because the amount is so small. It's down there at the bottom. And so you can visually see how much variation is being explained by late registration. Here's another way to look at it. So this is the predictive accuracy. Here's how going from uh, not looking at anything to looking at all of the variables, how much difference it makes in the predictive accuracy of the model. And what you can see visually here is that visually there is no difference at all in uh, the model. So connecting these uh, findings to the literature, in this study, 9.2% of registrations were late. And that's pretty consistent with the few studies that looked at the incidence of late registration. There is some variation. Very interesting, uh, Terry O'Banion posits that up to 50% of registrations in a course 
are late. And those of us who teach know that that's just a bizarre figure to put out there. Uh, but 10% seems to be about right. And uh, this study confirms the weak relationship between late registration and student success that is found in most of the best studies on late registration. So now back to you. Uh, looking, you know, that was very quick, I understand. But uh, from your perspective, what do you think were the strengths of this particular study in its design? That you did it? <laughs> that I did it? Yay. Thank you, I appreciate that. Please. Big data set. A big, big data set? Yep, big data set. That your resident didn't have to do it? Chris? Uh, Chris says it gives us a, a picture about a question that's very important and, and, a, and a big picture of it, looking at it not just in my class or my department or my college, but looking at it across the BCCS. Uh, some of the ones that I think are in there are that study population, uh, its size, and looking at that second semester. Uh, previously untested variables, no one's looked at course delivery mode and uh, the college success skills course in terms of late registration, and I thought those would make a difference, and they didn't. The definition of late registration, some of the definitions in the studies are bizarre. One of them defines late registration as a student who registers after two weeks into the semester. Yeah, and another one defines it as a student who registers a week before classes start. So the definition I think, uh, and, and the definition I have is not uh, the best. And the measures of uh, success looking at, because uh, a number of the studies looked at cumulative GPA or semester GPA, and I think that link is indirect. What I was interested in is what happens to a student in the class that they registered late for? That, because that's the, as a faculty member, that's what I'm seeing, okay? So when they come into my class late, how does that affect their success in that class? Uh, I think that the statistical methodology is a little better than in some of the studies. It's my opinion, uh, and folks will disagree with that. And I think the interpretation, partic statistical interpretation, particularly because I looked at effect size, and a number of studies did not do that. How could this study be improved? Yeah, let me get ready. No. This is not necessarily what you set out to do, so maybe it's not an improvement so much as uh, just a, a follow-up question that I have. Then is um, if you've got a you know you've got a professor who wants to work with a student in the second week and says, "Hey, come on in. I want to work with you. I want to add you to my class. I'm excited. I'm going to work with you." As a VP, I know that's going to be a successful situation because that professor is inviting it in as a late registration. I know you're not getting at that qualitative piece here through this data set, but that would, I wonder if that would exper explain some variation. No, I'm not getting at that, Chris, but I'm wondering if you're reading my slides, because that's actually going to be up there. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, and so it's, no, I think that's great. And um, when we're talking about improvements, you know, it's not a matter of critique in my study, but if we were going to look at this further, what might some things that we would do differently or in addition? Uh, do you have a microphone? Right here. A further question could be, what type of class are they coming into? Science, non-science, is it a 16-week, an 8-week, a 5-week? There's been a fair bit of um, research on that. It's all over the place um, in terms of this study will show they more likely register late into that class, and this one shows more likely that. Generally, the uh, hard sciences, they're going to register late into uh, less. In terms of student success, this research to date's not conclusive that the course makes a lot of difference. Same question, and then we have one back here. Again, this is probably outside the purview of the study, but what about uh, dynamic enrollment or rolling enrollments? What, what do you mean, Jerry? adding classes, especially online classes, consecutively. You know, a student can come in any week of the semester. It's a good one. And right in front of you, if you'll pass the microphone. Um, I'm still... You're, you're on. I'm still wondering if the type of student is going to make a difference in the data. I mean, when I've had students who are late enrollment for some reason that are strong students, 
they catch up. But when I have students who are weak to begin with, I struggle to get them where they need to be. They're slow readers. They've, you know, they've missed a week and a half of class and they're behind a hundred pages in a literature course and uh, they just may never catch up no matter what I do for them. I, I mean, think that's an incredibly important point. You know what, in this study though, didn't we do that? Didn't we look at the type of student? We said, oh, student success. What about the student who registers late? And we've been going down this road quite a bit and uh, we're not finding what we thought we would find. But we do think we're talking about human beings here. So we do think that the difference in student success has something to do with people. Chris noted that maybe it has to do with faculty to some extent. You're noting that maybe it has something to do with students. And what is it about the student that would make that difference? So for uh, me, I think that one improvement would be to define late registration as registering after the first class meeting. The reason that's not done is it's just a little harder to get the data that way and separate it out. Um, so you could do that. So a student who registers on Monday, but the class doesn't start till Tuesday, in the study I conducted would be counted as a late registrant. We could argue about whether or not that student really is since the class is not met. Uh, to Chris, to correlate uh, student success with faculty attitudes, Chris is an administrator. And uh, you, you as faculty know, some of your colleagues, a student comes in late, they hug them. They embrace them. They you know, support them. They welcome them. And you also know faculty who are hostile. And that student who comes in late, they're going to be disadvantaged, not necessarily because of late registration, but because the faculty member has put it in their mind, you're not going to succeed, or you're inconveniencing me, or you're, in, you're disrupting the, the class. So faculty attitudes. Um, and then also this one, I presented at the um, Council for the Study of Community Colleges, and someone in the audience had mentioned this. You know, they said, OK, so let's say the late registrant, it doesn't affect them negatively. What about the other students in the class? Their attitude, their perception of fairness, and how they're feeling when the instructor is going over again the thing that the instructor has already covered, you know, for this one person or two people who came in late. I thought that was a, a neat uh, suggestion. This is an important one for me, is to uh, avoid designs that reify the mythical influence of immutable demographics. So what we do is, you, you look at my study, what did I do? I went all, after all the familiar things. Let's look at race, let's look at gender. Well, you know, there's problems with that. There are significant problems with that. Because what if we found out that men didn't perform as well? What would we do? <laughs> so we make them women? We don't allow them into the class? So what happens is we create deficit models of certain subpopulations. And specifically, we say African Americans, African Americans, African Americans, African Americans. It keeps coming up over and over again, right? And so it, that's that thing about reifying, to make something into a thing, to make it kind of real. And so it gets into our brain that, oh, African Americans or males or these other uh, demographics. And it's too easy to jump to that. And it doesn't. The next one is it's not actionable. Because even if you know that stuff, and I'm not saying that uh, research isn't important. And Ty, you may remember a conversation you and I had driving back from Blue Ridge talking about your dissertation and talking about uh, the role of demographics in research. I'm not saying it's not important for us to know that stuff. It is. But because we uh, default to that, we have uh, kind of ossified our thinking in it. And it's in many ways, it's not helpful. We need to look at other uh, things that may make a greater difference. So I'd like to invite your uh, comments here. From this study, what are the major conclusions? I had two. You may have more. What are the major conclusions from this study? Uh, over here is that we should keep late registration. Do you have a Mimi? Do you have, Mimi says that we should keep Let late registration. Let him in. Go ahead. We need to rethink SDB classes. <laughs> Not necessarily the ability to proceed to the class. I think more, um, like for instance, I don't teach math, but I would think that coming in with a with a weak background in mathematics and then registering late would create a much larger problem than a student who had a strong background in mathematics coming into, say, um, Math 240, um, 
a statistics class that could easily <coughs> sail into the class, where a student that had just barely gotten through the MTE courses and maybe barely scraped through on a 163 or a 120, they would be at a much greater disadvantage. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see it as a demographic thing in terms of race, race and ethnicity right. because, as you said, we keep beating that dead horse. But I don't. I see it more as a, a background knowledge. Um, yeah, I mean, are they prepared to come into a class like that or not? Okay. More research. What else? What other conclusions? Go ahead, Tony. I would suggest another variable that we've looked at just informally in some of our science classes is how many other commitments do they have outside of school? I mean, are they working full time? Are they working part time? Do they have family responsibilities? Because if a person has the time, that's going to factor into their ability to be able to catch up or not. And if they're, I mean, we have students who, when we ask them to fill out their schedule for when they're going to study for bio, they realize like two to four a.m. two days a week is like the only time they have. Right. And you know, if that kind of situation, the student's going to be less able to catch up if they come in as a late registration. So you're both think, talking so. about looking at more than late registration. Yeah, looking at the student I think, in a much more complex mm -hmm. way. There's a behind you. So perhaps one way to get at the um, question of preparedness is to look at courses that have prerequisites and see, look at the performance in the prerequisite course and then see, uh, link that to perhaps the performance in the late registered course. Okay, good. Teresa? Yeah, do we have a... Wow. <laughs> For me, it, it strikes twofold. Uh, defining light by the number of classes they missed, comparing one class missed versus two classes missed versus three classes missed. And then a fact has, and my thinking would be, if you've missed three classes, your success rate goes down versus missing one class. Um, and then the second thing is, this strikes me as, I'm not serving my students the way I need to. I prepare lectures and materials for my online classes. Why can't I record those beginning materials, record my syllabus, make it available to them? provide that preparatory stuff that they would have gotten on the first day and the second day and then the study would be you know what effect would that have of having those materials available you know online that students can access and I think it would serve all our students because you're not going to remember that from the first day but you can go back and revisit it versus not having any of that support material this is really as a way to you know ameliorate some of this. Really good point, Jurassic. You and others have flipped the question. We're no longer talking now about uh, why don't students succeed, but you all are talking about what interventions may positively affect student success of late registrants. Well, when, when I talk about um, my students missing that whole first day introduction, I use lecture capture. I record everything. And all of all of the materials are available to them on Blackboard, and I offer to go over I, the, the handouts that I gave them the first day. If they have any questions, I'll go over that with them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I teach upper level math. They miss the first week of upper level math courses, Calc one, even, even one sixty four, pre calculus two. They miss the first week, and. The odds on them completing that course successfully with me, no matter how much additional support I'm trying to give them at the beginning, is just ridiculously low. I just don't see it happening. Your results are astounding me because I don't see it in my math classes. Well, let me uh, tell you how I got started on this. Let me tell you how I got started on this. So I'm serving as department chair in English at uh, John Tyler Community College, and a faculty member buttonholes me in the hallway and says, "Hey." we got to get rid of late registration in developmental English. I said, oh, why? Because those students don't succeed as well as the other students. I said, oh, how do you know? And he said, well, I have this student and I have that student. So what I did was uh, I worked with the IRE office and we looked specifically at developmental English. We couldn't find it there. So the impression that we have may not be uh, there. And there have been studies of other uh, levels of classes. Um, let me go, because there are a few more discussion questions. So I want to share with you uh, the conclusions I come to. That late registration in and of itself and in combination with other factors is just not a good predictor. You know those models? They, very, they do a great job of predicting who succeeds. They do a terrible job of predicting who won't succeed because people are complicated. And they say, 
um, I do have extra time, or I'm motivated, or my mom's a math teacher, and she's going to help me. Uh, so there are other factors that uh, the statistics are not going to capture, and, and other things that influence. So we know that some of those students who register late are not going to succeed for all of the reasons that have been discussed here. But for every one of those students, there seems to be another student who those reasons don't apply. They're not pertinent because they have strategies and they have support networks that allow them to um, move beyond that. And uh, I respectfully submit that further research isn't worth it. There, this has been studied since 1964. There are over 30 uh, publicly available studies. And if you look at them holistically, and I have an article uh, that I've submitted for publication that does a very detailed analysis. And actually, there's an appendix, like 30-page appendix, where I looked at every study and looked, say, where was the study population, and what was the statistical methodology, and what were the major findings. But overall, if you look at it uh, together, there's no there there. And I don't know what O'Banion means when he says the case is overwhelming. I'm not sure what he's reading. And uh, Sandy Shugart says three times is uh, likely. I don't know where he got that data from, because I've read all the studies. I haven't seen that data point. So I'm not sure where he, he is getting that. Also, three times, uh, you've got to look at what that really means. And you have to look at the effect size uh, to tell you whether or not that's actually meaningful. So what do you think, are, from your perspective, are the implications for policy? Policy and practice. Yeah, do we have the interesting experiment, and I'm I'm hoping they're going to collect some data. I assume they are. Is you know Nova not allowing late registration starting in the fall? It'll be interesting to see how this affects their student population, enrollment, and success going forward, because that's a big data set, I would think, that might get us some interesting insights. I think it's important to note there uh, about NOVA. Most institutions that I know of have not gotten rid of late registration. They say they have, but they still let students into the class late because the student is in uh, this course, and they found out they needed the prerequisite. And so what do we do? Do we say to them, ah, sorry, you got advised into the wrong course. You're going to have to wait till January. No, we switch that student in. Uh, a teacher uh, drops out, and we have to cancel the section, and we rearrange the students. We don't send those students back you know, and tell them to come back in January. Also, Northern is not just eliminating late registration. They're taking a much more holistic view of this. And so there is an SDB component in there. There is a student uh, uh, developmental course requirement component. And Valencia, which is one of the leaders in this area and has eliminated late registration, it, they didn't elim eliminate late registration. They implement it, start right. That's their, their program. That program is a wraparound program that has all kinds of things in it not just late registration. Late registration is just one uh, piece of that. Other policy implications? Ty, let me get you. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that uh, when you're talking about policy implications, it's, it's not all about uh, student success. There's still, there's still costs associated with processing late registration. And uh, maybe one of the implications is if, if we're not going to uh, eliminate late registration for reasons of student success, maybe we need find, to find uh, more cost-effective ways of processing late registrants. Uh, very, very good point. Cost and coming back to that. You know, uh, what Northern is going to do and what um, Valencia did and a number of other colleges is there's no such thing as late registration because when you come in late, they say, you're not late, you're early. The class starts on Monday. They have rolling schedules. And your large institutions can do this. And uh, Valencia, uh, and I use them just as one example because uh, Sandy Shugart visited with us and spent quite a bit of time describing his program, but there are a number of other community colleges out there that have done similar things. Uh, Valencia realized that you don't have to offer every class late. Just offer the, the core, right? So offer English 111, History 121, Bio 101, Psych 200. Offer those four courses. Students can get 12 credits, in, and that course starts next Monday. And so you don't have to offer all of your things, but you can provide sufficient options for most students to get in there. Now, your smaller institutions, that's not going to work. But Northern, uh, from what I understand, I don't know this for true, I, for, for sure, but I was told that they're going to do this kind of uh, rolling thing. I, I hope we can do that at Thomas Nelson. How do they hold those positions open if they start a week late? Do you know? You know, I have to find out more. I was speaking to a woman from San Jacinto uh, Community College the other day, and 
uh, when I was uh, at CSCC, and she was telling me how they were doing it, and I'm going to call her and find out some of that mechanics. I'm very interested to learn more. Uh, the plan is to offer 14-week and 12-week classes, as well as the eight-week classes that we've been offering. Um, and so many divisions are handling it, of course, all a little different, but I know many divisions are doing, like, allowing um, a certain number to register and then not opening the rest of the registrations in that class. So enough that the class will make that will be allowed to run, but then That's holding great. the rest of the seats until after the other registration deadline has passed. Thank you for that helpful information we have over here. We're doing the same thing in combination. Where are you? Um, I'm at Piedmont, Piedmont? Virginia. Uh, but in, it's in conjunction with the new developmental math redesign. So at the conclusion of the first five-week session, we have late start classes that like only require the MTE5 to get into. So if they finish up oh, with an MTE5 that first four weeks, then they can roll straight into a course like Math 157 that only requires MTE5. So they, they have a full semester of of a course still, but we and we do the same thing. We let a certain number in, but then we block it and hold it so that there's room for those students who complete MTE5 to get So in it's interesting, there. again, notice the conversation has shifted from banning late registration to, you know, how do we work uh, with the late registration um, context in order to make our operations more efficient and rational and to better serve students. Um, you know, the, peer, the case against late registration is weak, but expert opinion, that is faculty, you talk to faculty, they say, this isn't a good idea. You know, and the data can only tell you so much. you got to go to the experts, and the experts are saying late registration is not a, a good idea. And there's no one out there saying, you know what, let's have more late registration. You know, there's no one saying that would positively affect student success. Uh, but it is a necessary resource for certain students, particularly misplaced or those that were incorrectly enrolled. Students do seem to exercise deliberate choice. They are not doing this, from the reports we have, uh, capriciously, but they're doing it in a way that makes sense in their personal context, and students defend their choices and their rights to make those choices. So one of the conclusions, I guess the ultimate conclusion I have, is that the crusade against late registration, I think it's a problem because it diverts our attention from the real issues. And why, why do we focus on late registration? Because it's easy. It's boxable. We can point to it. We can say, there's the villain, right? And it has a name, you know? But you want to affect um, student success? That's really hard to do. And you know how we know how it's hard to do? Because we've been trying to get it right for decades, and we haven't moved the needle. We haven't moved the needle. We've been struggling with student success, and what we're doing has not uh, worked. So we need to really focus on those other institutional practices and the other student behaviors. There's a student piece in here that may have greater effect on student success. And then I just want to go to, to that uh, question. So based on the research and what we know, what are the institutional characteristics and the student characteristics that do have a greater relationship with student success? And this is important, that maybe we can change. Because we can't change their gender, their sex. I think that idea of college readiness and how they test on the placement test, because there's a lot of data that shows that those who need developmental classes are not successful in terms of, or have lower success due to, um, you know, in terms of graduation and retention. Mm -hmm. Coll being college ready? <laughs> Just the age old full time versus part time uh, piece, and that doesn't fully explain it, but, but it's part of it. Um, and also, I wonder about students who pay themselves versus um, have the courses paid for them. <laughs> full-time, part-time in terms of who? The student. The student. Also, we know that full-time, part-time faculty ratio makes a difference. I wonder about that full-time, part-time. You know, that's one that the chancellor is on. So if, uh, and there's another one. I was at a, the, a conference, and they're doing the reverse transfer. So we know students who have an associate's degree or get jobs, and they're they're less likely to be unemployed, and they make uh, more money. And so institutions are doing reverse transfer. They're going to VCU, and they're saying, hey, you have some of our students. Oh, that student took some courses at your institution that actually will complete the degree. Let's give them the associate's degree. And the thinking there is that it'll improve their success. I'm not sure. I mean, that's the Wizard of Oz, right? So you just give them a thing, and you say, you now have an associate's degree. Does that make her more successful? To take a student who is part-time and make them full-time I don't know. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm saying I don't know. But we can't assume that just by turning them to full time, because what there may be other factors 
with that full-time student that are the real factors. See, that's what you're learning about late registration. It's not late registration. Late registration becomes a proxy for some other things. What other institutional and personal characteristics do we know? I wonder if any institution has tried providing child care support. I have many students, and that's one of a big um, burden and a, a problem for them for a class. That's really good. I haven't seen in the research where that's affected student success because I just haven't seen it. Somebody uh, uh, to address them. Goals. Go ahead. If you can convince them of a goal, they'll buy into it. Look at our nursing students. Look at our tech programs. They have a specific goal, and they're driven by the job. They'll get after it. I think we've got to do a better job of giving them goals. It is the them. biggest effect on student success, self-efficacy, commitment to college, motivation, the belief that uh, I was reading a, a study. They were looking at self-efficacy and test-taking ability, and they found out the test-taking ability was not very well correlated with uh, the placement test. They didn't necessarily, you know, if you were a good test taker, you didn't do necessarily do well on the placement test, but it was uh, correlated with student success overall. You know, so their uh, locus of control is huge, right? That teacher gave me an F, right? How, how often have you had that? The teacher did this to me, you know? Uh, it, so the student is looking outside. My, my, my significant other did this to me. My job did this to me. The financial aid office did this to me. Those students are not likely to succeed. The student who says, well, I really wanted to get that grade, and so I w did what I took. I went to the instructor's office hours every office hour. You know, that student who believes that their success is in their hands is much more likely to succeed. And can we affect locus of control? It's, it's a difficult challenge, but, you know, the military has done a lot of research on self-efficacy because they need their... Uh, they, they need the military personnel to be self-efficacious, and so they've looked at how do you affect that with a student. So that may be a big one. What other institutional and personal characteristics do we have um, right next to you? Well, I, I don't know if there's been research on the community college student, but the four-year student, there's been some research on health risk behaviors and that connection to students. Health success. risk behaviors? I think mm -hmm. I'd heard something. Like Participation in health risks. And, and how it connects to their academic performance. What about institutional? Because that's what we're talking about, right? With late registration, we're saying, what can we do? And we said, let's get rid of late registration. And then the research shows, ah, it's not really going to make a difference. And I'm telling you, if the BCC, I, this is, I'll put this on the table. If the BCCS gets rid of late registration tomorrow, you look at student success five years from now, it's going to be flat. It's not going to make a difference. What are the institutional characteristics that we can change that will affect student success? Amy. Our offices are open from 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, and I know as a working adult, when I want to get my business done, needs to be after 5 o'clock or on weekends. So if we changed our hours of service so that we would be available to our students when they are ordinarily available. I can one-up you. Our business office closes at 4.30. And uh, if a student comes to the division office and gets added to a class at 445, they go to the business office, they can't pay. Guess what we do to them? We drop, we drop them. them you know. Right, because they don't add. <laughs> right? So they're back in, and, and it does affect. Okay, so business practices can affect. Um, I know there's been some research that shows in, at the community college level that if students are part of student organizations, they, and in essence, one might be able to interpret that as feeling connected to the college, um, then they are more likely to be successful as engagement, well. Engagement, 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 and the institution has a role in that engagement. Faculty to student interaction, and not just the amount, but the quality of that interaction. One of the biggest effects on student success is the peer group, their connectedness with their peers, the sense of community at the institution how long they stay on campus. So how can we make our institutions more welcoming? You all have the same student. They come in, they drive in, they take their class, and they go home. If we can get them to hang out in the quad or in the library or where have you for another hour and get to meet another student, get connected to organizations, we can make uh, differences. Also, student support services is huge, and it's something we don't do well in the BCCS. If you look at us compared to nationally, we don't fund student support very well. This is something that the chancellor has recently been very excited about. He was talking about it in a visit to Thomas Nelson. He wants to uh, develop the career coaches program. We know that counseling and advising have significant effects. 
in my opinion, and I don't have the data for this, it would be interesting to look, but uh, having served at two institutions and worked uh, at a system level with faculty, I think we have incredible faculty. I don't think the issue is the faculty. Uh, you know, of course, you have that faculty member out there who's, you know, a wild card, but most of our faculty are great and they're really committed. So I don't think that uh, the issue is there, but I don't think we uh, support our students after the classroom. I don't think that they have, you know, we have uh, counselors who are working with 200 students. You know, we have advisors who are working with 200 students. And so what is the quality of care that they're, they're getting there? Uh, tutoring services we know make a difference. All kinds of academic uh, support. So there are institutional things. Uh, for, for student characteristics, high school GPA is one of the best predictors of college success. So if we can get students to have success in high school, so we've got to reach back into the high school. That's where they're failing in our community colleges. They don't fail at the community college. They fail in sixth grade, in ninth grade. So we've got to reach back there and uh, affect them there. The first generation came up. So you can't make them uh, non-first generation. But what can you do to make that student be behave to have the attitudes and the skills and the attributes that a first generation uh, <coughs> student might have? Uh, and then, like I said, the motivation, I think, is uh, key. Well, I I'm about out of time. and We'll, we'll give a last word here. Do we have, let's get the microphone to you. I would agree 100% the problem starts way back. The problem is we don't have any control over that. And so we get these students. Don't we? No. I think we do. When's the last time your college contacted your middle school? Okay, good. Well, you know, I mean, you, you got to keep trying. I mean, it, it, we, we don't have a history of that. The four-year institutions don't have a history of that with us. The four-year institutions don't have a history of reaching back to us and saying, hey, how can we make the pathways uh, more effective? But let me tell you, I've been here since 1993. We, the four years are doing a much better job with us now than they were 10 and 15 years ago. And we're doing a much better job with K-12 than we were doing even five years ago. Are we where we need to be? Uh, almost certainly not. Northern has a, has a really good model that uh, you're working with uh, JMU and you have a counselor in the high school that's assigned to the student like in their junior year, follows them in their junior and senior year, follows them through their two-year program at NOVA, and then follows them at JMU. GMU, excuse me, George Mason, the other one, right? And their success, and this is focused on underserved students, if I recall, and the enrollment and success of that population since this initiative it's through the roof. It's not, you know, like this. It's like uh, this. So we, we know that if we do work with our partners, there are po possibilities there. There are also people don't want to play with us. That's true. You know, and those relationships are, are a little broken. Last word? Who shall have the last word? Laura. Maybe the fact that you did not find a difference says something about how wonderful the faculty are at our colleges. I'll take that. <laughs> wonderful last word. Thank you so much, folks. Have a great day. Take that. Thank you. Thank you.